Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review, where we will be fixing our back and then wrapping up the last usually seven, but this week's thumbnail is a little bit deceiving because technically the last six Founders of the Day, because you remember I was a little ill last week. I do apologize for that. So I am one article short this week for the first time in three and a half years almost. So thank you for joining me and for giving me uh welcome we're going to talk about the american revolution i'm going to note i'm going to do something again that i started last week where i essentially each different founder we talk about i kind of shoot in a separate video i'm doing this for two reasons first of all i release the clips throughout the week of those for people who don't necessarily have the time or desire to sit here for a whole hour and listen to them all in a row they can listen to them every morning uh but also in case someone new pops on that's never seen the channel before uh they won't feel left out so i'll restart over so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for hitting like and subscribe. Uh, let me know if there are any founders you want me to cover in the future next week. Although I do have some planned out uh, in association with the Steam Patriots who I spoke to yesterday. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. It was a little different than most of what I talk about here, but a lot of fun nonetheless. So, let's start talking about some American revolutionaries, shall we? Okay. So, Hi, Founder fans. Today's founder is John Haring. Now, John Haring is a lot of fun, not necessarily because he wrote the Orangetown Resolutions, which we get to, but because of his work in several different states. So let's talk about it. John Haring was from upstate New York, a town called Orangetown. Now, Orangetown was in Orange County. I want to talk for a second about resolutions. Leading into the American Revolution, just before hostilities started and even after they began, many towns and counties would get together and write resolutions. Essentially, much the same way these towns and counties would send representatives to their colonial legislatures, well, they would also get together and write instructions to their representatives in the colonial legislatures, and these instructions were usually called resolutions. And the person we think wrote the resolutions for Orangetown, which is in upstate New York, a couple dozen miles north of New York City, person we think wrote the Orangetown Resolutions was a gentleman named John Haring, to my right. And, well, actually, that's not him. No known image. <laughs> uh, his name's over there. And John Haring, uh, as I said, probably wrote the Orangetown Resolutions. And then, when the First Continental Congress was called into session, he was selected to represent Orange County alongside Henry Wisner at that very First Continental Congress. Now, New York elected their representatives in a fairly peculiar manner. Some other colonies did this also, but they generally elected the counties elected their representatives. Uh, uh, William Floyd from Long Island was elected by Suffolk County. Many of the members from New York City were elected by uh, uh, New York. I believe, I think now it's called, it was, um, now I think it's called New York County, but I'm not sure what it was back then. Either way, they elected these representatives who then went to the First Continental Congress. And so therefore, John Haring was actually very directly elected by the people in his community. Now he goes to the First Continental Congress. Um, he's there for the whole time. He is, New York City, believe it or not, actually sends pretty conservative delegates to the First Continental Congress who didn't want to say too much against the king, including people like John Jay, was very conservative when he, things first got going. John Haring, however, and Henry Wisner, and some of the other people from uh, the counties outside New York City, the more rural areas, they were a little bit uh, more excited to not be radical yet. This is the first Continental Congress, but, but make a bold statement. 
Uh, and so John Herring and his buddy Henry Wisner were able to essentially rein in the conservatives from New York. And what the results were, they helped defeat the Galloway Plan of Union and instead bring us the Continental Association and the Declaration of Rights and Grievances that were signed and sent out after the First Continental Congress. Now, John Herring is a very pre peculiar case because most people who went to the First Continental Congress and were there till the end signed the document. John Herring didn't actually sign the Continental Association. He left pretty much right away to come back to New York and start helping his community uh, get back to business because there was no revolution yet. It would still be another six months till the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Now, once there was a Battle of Lexington and Concord, well, John Herring becomes a dedicated revolutionary. He's sent to the New York Provincial Congress and is actually president pro temper of the New York Provincial Congress for a while, which in a fashion kind of made him chief executive while they sorted out the writing a state constitution and electing a first governor and everything like that. Herring then spends the pretty much the entirety of the 1780s at, at, in the New York State Senate, and he really commits to the state level at that point, though I will note he is twice sent back to the Continental Congress, at that point called the uh, Congress of the Confederation, uh, before uh, essentially be, uh, returning to New York. Uh, now, he comes back to New York. He becomes a person who settles boundary disp disputes. He actually goes to a meeting in Connecticut that is set up to pool down tensions and boundary disputes between New York and Massachusetts. Again, one of the reasons, that the, one of the many reasons the Constitution was written for the United States was to help states settle things like border disputes. Uh, uh, famously, there was the Mount Vernon Conference trying to settle disputes between Virginia and Maryland. And here we are meeting in Connecticut to settle a dispute between Massachusetts and New York. Now, he does pretty good at this, and people are very happy with his decisions. He is then chosen as a member of the New York State Ratification Convention, where he actually becomes an anti-federalist, despite the fact that it would help solve these boundary disputes. Maybe he likes solving boundary disputes. And speaking of boundary changes, he spent this entire career that I've just discussed in New York, living right on the border of New Jersey. And then... A boundary has changed, and what do you know, his house now falls on the New Jersey side of the line. And this longtime New York delegate, who didn't want the Constitution because he wanted New York to maintain the power, is now a New Jersey resident, and he is actually sent to the New Jersey Assembly for two years. Because, well, he was good at being a politician, and New Jersey recognized that. So he goes to New Jersey for two years, and then he returns, he actually ends up moving back to New York because... He spent his life there and obviously preferred New York. And he moved back to New York and he is again sent to the New York State Senate after having just served in the New Jersey Assembly. Uh, he's sent to the New New York State Senate, but he only serves for one term because he decides to retire from there. So that is the life of John Herring, a very much underappreciated delegate to the First Continental Congress. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit like and subscribe for American Revolution all week long. Thank you. Oh, choked on my own throat. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I take a sip of water real quick. And for those of you paying attention, yes, I did bring the ugly blue water bottle back. I have a little bit of a toothache. And until that gets resolved, I can only drink water without wincing in pain through the ugly bottle. I don't know why. <laughs> that is just the world we found ourselves living in now, isn't it? We are going to pop on over to John Brown Cutting. This guy is a very interesting character. So, let's get on with it. Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. And our, today's founder is John Brown Cutting. John Brown Cutting, considering his status in South Carolina society, is actually a very hard character to find things about his early life on. What we do know is that in his early 20s, he joins the Revolutionary War. And he joins and he becomes an assistant apothecary general in the middle department of the Continental Army. Uh, so pretty much what we would call the, consider the mid-Atlantic of the East Coast nowadays. John Brown Cutting becomes an assistant apothecary general. And apothecaries at the time are essentially what we would consider pharmacists today. Uh, and as an assistant general, that's a pretty important position. Now, Cutting never seems to have any medical training. Uh, but he does go by the title doctor for the rest of his life, and it seems to be as this brief stint working as an assistant apothecary general where he feels the ability to carry that title. Again, this is a time where pretty much anyone could just go call themselves a doctor and be a doctor. So let's not be too hard on him. 
after the war concludes, Dr. Cutting does not want to be a physician. He actually wants to be a lawyer. And he travels to London where he studies law and becomes a lawyer. And while he's overseas, he becomes friendly with many other Americans serving overseas, notably Thomas Jefferson, William Short, and a gentleman named John Adams. You might recognize the name John Adams. He would be president one day. At this point, Adams travels to the Netherlands to negotiate uh, financial support from the Dutch. He travels with John Brown Cutting, and John Brown Cutting actually serves as his secretary, John Adams' secretary, on a temporary basis for a few months. Now, this is despite uh, Cutting's a little bit of a reputation for being a gossip. Uh, Thomas Jefferson never said that he thought Cutting would go out and just spread the news of American diplomacy to people who shouldn't hear it. But he did think Cutting might use some of his insider knowledge to impress some of the ladies. That's me trying to... Anyway, uh, he thought he might use his insider knowledge to try and impress ladies, and that might get word out. Uh, that's probably why Cutting never really gets a diplomatic position. He only serves as a secretary for a little while. Um, but he actually then gets recruited by the... Uh, Prince of Luxembourg. Now, we don't talk about Luxembourg very frequently at all during the American Revolution, uh, but they did help in one significant way. You see, if we travel back to when the war was still going on, South Carolina sends its Commodore Alexander Gillian to uh, lease a ship from the Prince of Luxembourg. Uh, again, much like each colony and then state had their own militias, many, not all, but many of the states had their own navy. Uh, and South Carolina had Alexander Gillian, who was actually a very important, though a little bit controversial, commodore in the South Carolina Navy. Uh, and as I said, he rents a sh he leases a ship from Luxembourg. They aptly name it the South Carolina. And the South Carolina is one of the more important ships of the Revolutionary War. However, the war ends, and the Prince of Luxembourg wants his money for the ship he leased, and he sends today's founder, John Brown Cutting, over back to his home of South Carolina to try and get money for the prince. Now, this doesn't go well. <laughs> South Carolina doesn't have any money. This is also, I will note, uh, before the Constitution uh, comes into play and before Alexander Hamilton collects his assumption plan to collect all the state's debts together, and... Well, Cutting is not able to get this money for the Prince of Luxembourg, and actually this financial problem would haunt South Carolina for decades. Uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to have been included in Hamilton's assumption plan once it comes through. Uh, I, I was unable to locate exactly why that is, but it does hamper South Carolina from growing and becoming... Uh, South Carolina grows like the rest of the states do, I should say that, but it does hamper their ability to do so, trying to pay back this one really important ship to the Revolutionary War. Now, Cutting goes back after just a year in South Carolina. He goes back to Europe. And while he's there, uh, he begins engaging in an attempt to help free soldiers in British custody. Now, um, the British never stopped impressing soldiers. And just to remind you, impressment is when you capture a sailor on another ship, put them on your ship, put them in your uniform, and say you're fighting for us now. And this was a fairly common practice. In fact, it would lead to the War of 1812, just, what, 30, 40 years after the American Revolution. One of the leading causes of that war was the impressment of soldiers. It was also a cause of the Revolutionary War, but not on the top of the laundry list of complaints. Now, there were over a thousand American soldiers essentially being imprisoned into the British Navy. And Cutting does his best to liberate these soldiers from their situation. And he does this pretty much at his own expense. Now, he returns to the United States not long after this, both practicing law and seeking reimbursement from the federal government. I mean, these are technically American sailors he just freed, and his old, I don't want to say buddy, but uh, boss, John Adams, had become president by this point. Now, Cutting does receive $2,000 for his troubles, and that is a lot of money for the time. However, it's not the most money in the world, especially when he spent a lot more than that securing the freedom of these American sailors. Uh, unfortunately, he spends the next decade or so, the remainder of his life, trying to recoup this money uh, unsuccessfully, but living back home in America, acting as a lawyer. And that is the story of John Brown Cutter, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, John Brown Cutting, who is an American founder. I hope you learned a little bit. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, definitely hit like and subscribe for American Revolution all week long. Oh, man.
Lots of fun. John Brown Cutting. What do you think? Do you think John Brown Cutting is a fun, fun character? I like him. Woodbury Langdon is super interesting. He is not as much fun as John Brown Cutting is. Uh, and for whatever reason, we are going to be talking about the Navy a lot today. That is not the last time we'll be hearing about the Navy this afternoon. Uh, take a quick sip of water. Spilling on my face. For those of you just signing in, welcome to sp Spilling Water on My Face with the American Revolution. <laughs> no, we're about to start our next founder, Woodbury Langdon. Hi, founder fans. Jason here. And today's founder is Woodbury Langdon. If that name sounds a little bit familiar, it's because he's often overshadowed by his much more famous brother, John Langdon, a future governor of uh, the colony the state of Massachusetts, a leader of the Sullivan-Clinton campaign in upstate New York, yada, yada, yada. John Sullivan is a pretty famous American revolutionary, arguably the most famous from New Hampshire, maybe John Stark. Now, his brother Woodbury, like him, came from a, a family with a successful father who was a farmer and a shipbuilder uh, out in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now, Woodbury and his brother John decided they didn't want to be shipbuilders, and instead they wanted to join the mercantile trade. So Woodbury Langdon... Uh, studies how to build a counting house under a man named Henry Sherburn. Now, he ends up marrying Sherburn's daughter, Sarah. They start a family. Woodbury strikes out on his own, and he gets pretty extraordinary wealth for himself. And by the time Lexington and Concord breaks out, Woodbury Langdon is one of the more successful merchants in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And then, the Lexington and Concord happens, and, well, Woodbury Langdon realizes, hey, I'm owed a lot of money in Great Britain, and they're cutting off Boston before they come cut off Portsmouth. I better get on a ship and sail to England to go get my money. I'll remind you that leading up to the American Revolution, the colonists were only allowed to trade with Great Britain, and therefore their banking was only done with Great Britain. Of course, that's not how it played out. There was a lot of smuggling going on. As you know, uh, many people made a lot of money smuggling and trading with other countries. But everything that was done above board was done with Great Britain, usually London. Woodbury Langdon had done plenty of business above board. That's why he was not seen as super suspicious when he went to get his money <laughs> from London. And that's why he was able to travel to London. He goes to London, spends two years in England, and never gets his money, gets fed up, comes back home. That's when he gets to New York City. And as you can see to my right, he gets detained in New York City. You see, by the time he gets back, General Howe is taking over New York City. And he's sitting there with his soldiers occupying the city. And this ship comes in with Woodbury Langdon on. Now, Woodbury's brother, John, at this point, had already made quite a name for himself. Was already a major general in the Continental Army. Uh, and, well, the... um. And I apologize. No, I confused him with John Sullivan. Uh, Woodbury Langdon's brother did not lead the Sullivan-Clinton campaign. Yeah, that was John Sullivan, also from New Hampshire. I apologize for that. I do want to correct myself. But his brother had made a name for himself in the Continental Congress, would be a future governor, yada, yada, yada. So Woodbury's loyalties are questioned, and General Howe doesn't know what to do with him. So he detains him in New York City, but he's, al he's on parole. So he's allowed to move about New York openly and freely, and eventually Woodbury does leave Manhattan. Uh, not with permission, he escapes. He goes back to Portsmouth, and that's when he devotes himself to the Patriot cause. He hasn't gotten his money from Europe, he's been detained in Britain, he's done with it, and New Hampshire sends him to the Continental Congress, just like his brother went. So Woodbury goes, uh, he serves there for a few years, uh, well, he serves there for one year, despite being elected to four terms in the Continental Congress, Woodbury then goes back to New Hampshire and serves in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, and he serves on the Governor's Council, which is essentially the cabinet for the state of New Hampshire. He's then selected to the New Hampshire Superior Court. He is an Associate Justice of the New Hampshire Superior Court. Now, he spends a year in this position, and then he resigns to attend to his private affairs. As we've seen, this guy likes to make money for himself. Now, by 1786, he's actually again chosen for the Superior Court, and this time he'd stay there for five years. But his second stint in the uh, New Hampshire Superior Court is a little bit controversial. He actually faces impeachment uh, for neglect of duties. Now, during the impeachment trial, Woodbury Langdon actually argues that the pay given to an associate justice is so meager that he needs to attend to his private business or he'd go broke just serving his country. Again, guy likes money. 
Furthermore, he complains that the legislature was too involved in the court's decisions and the running of the court. Again, this is just a, just a year before the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention happens, and that's written. And separation of of powers is very important to these people. And Woodbury Langdon is basically saying, "No, you're too involved in the court. There there shouldn't be this much." There should be more separation. Now, he does get impeached in the House of Representatives, but as we've learned recently, the way impeachment works is once you're impeached in the House of Representatives, and this is done at the state level too, then it goes to the state Senate, who will then have a trial to see if you should be convicted or removed from your position. However, once impeachment goes through, Woodbury decides to just resign from his position instead of going through the hassle and trouble of a trial and that embarrassment. So he resigns, goes back to private life, presumably makes more money, and then he actually runs for the United States uh, Congress. He actually runs for U.S. House of Representatives, but his his reputation had taken quite a hit after the whole impeachment thing, and he does not successfully get that. And he retires and spends the remainder of his days in private life, making lots and lots and lots of money. So that is the story of Woodbury Langdon, an important, though much underappreciated, American founder. I hope you learned a little bit. If you did, make sure you hit like and subscribe for American Revolution all week long. Let's see who's next. I'm <laughs> running through them. Run, run, run. William Barron. All right, all right. Let me take a trip. We talk about the Barron family. We're about to hear a lot about the Barron family in the next uh, few founders here the next two founders um excuse me so let's get right into it hi founder fans jason here and today's founder is william barron now william barron comes from the barron naval family of the american founding uh the this particular baron serves in the american revolutionary war uh he has i believe they were nephews were very important to the uh first barbary war uh Second Barbary War, War of 1812, the second kind of generation of American naval heroes. Uh, so this gentleman comes from a very important naval family, although he is one of the much, much, much lesser known American founders. So William Barron, as I said, from Virginia, part of a naval family, has siblings, joining the this and that. He honed his craft as a, as a, as a uh, seaman. Uh, on merchant ships, trading variety of products, and I should note, including slaves, early in his years, uh, although he was just working his way up, learning the ship. It wasn't his ship at that point. Uh, when the Revolutionary War begins, he signs up with the fledgling Continental Army. I'm um, sorry, Continental Navy, obviously. Uh, and he's actually named a lieutenant on a new ship called the Boston. Now, the Boston, obviously, it's a, uh, a warship. It's supposed to attack enemies at sea, but its first job is to transport a few people to Europe. And among these people being sent to Europe is a new diplomat. You might know him. His name is John Adams. Yes, the Boston carrying John Adams for the first time across the ocean to Europe. William Barron is one of the people on the ship. Now, on the way, they see a French ship. They're, they've not yet established... A, a treaty or relationship with the French yet at this point, but the French and the Americans are being pretty cool to each other. So while they're traveling, they see the French ship, and what they're going to do is fire a cannon to signify to the other ship their friendly intentions. Uh, at the time, there were a variety of ways that ships would communicate with each other with the way they raised and lowered their flags, the way they fired cannons and guns, and this was to be a shot simply to say, hi, how you doing? We're friends here. Unfortunately, weaponry at the time was not perfect, and sometimes cannons exploded. And when they shot off this friendly shot, the cannon exploded, and William Barron was standing right next to it when it exploded, and his leg was shattered. I should warn you, I should have already warned you, this gets a little gross. I will try and make it as not gross as possible, but ship explodes, I'm sorry, not the ship, just the cannon. The ship's fine. The ship explodes. Baron's leg essentially explodes. My lights fall down and scare the life out of me and my cat. Uh, and Baron is taken to back. Now, there is a ship's doctor, and the ship's doctor immediately recommends amputation. Fix my leg. <laughs> the ship's doctor recommends amputation. They put a tourniquet on, and they start sawing. And it is a horrific scene. I don't know if you've ever... <laughs> Now that I've ever seen a real amputation, but you can imagine, it is absolutely terrible. Now, while he's going through this 
painful, awful experience, William Barron is being held in the arms of John Adams. John Adams actually assists with the amputation of this man. While he's getting his legs sawed off, Barron is in extreme pain and he begs this new diplomat on his way to Europe, John Adams, to take care of his wife and daughter should he not survive. I, we don't know exactly what, the, what was said. Most of this story actually comes from John Adams' diary, but it seems that John Adams kept his promise because after 11 painful days, William Barron does die. Uh, he's buried at sea. He is... It's weighed down with cannonballs. He's tied to a, a not a raft, but a, a coffin, essentially. They weigh it down. They drop it in the ocean. Presumably, he's still in the middle of the Atlantic. Adams does seem to keep his word, though we don't know exactly if he establishes any relationship with Barron's family. Again, they're in Virginia. Um, I, he would eventually establish a relationship with some of the William's nephews because they would fight in the quasi-war that President Adams would oversee. Uh, uh, he, Adams does write a letter, as soon as he gets to France, writes a letter to the Continental Congress on William's behalf. And later on, William's daughter actually does receive the half-pay pension that would be given to soldiers for their families. So, just to sum up, John Adams held a, man's, held a man while his leg was amputated, and then kept his promise to contact the family uh, and look after the family of that soldier who in a very friendly fire incident, gave his life for the American cause that, well, John Adams would eventually become the leader of about 20 years later. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, definitely hit like and subscribe for more American, Revol American Revolution, if I can get it out of my mouth, seven days a week. Hope I didn't gross you guys out too much. I'm going to fix my light. I don't know exactly what happened here. I'm sorry if this is the worst sound you've ever heard. I have little, uh, the... I don't know if they're Chinese lights, the like things you open and put over, over my lamp. I don't know. Very makeshift here at Founder of the Day. Um, take a quick sip of my water. It's super hot. I did have to, I had my AC, little window AC unit on all day. Not all day. For like an hour and a half to cool off the room and turn it off right before I shot or else it would make the sound terrible. So as this video progresses, I am slowly getting redder and redder as I start to sweat. So forgive me for being horrible to look at. Okay. Stephen Decatur. Okay. Stephen Decatur. There is a lot to say about this gentleman. Excuse me. Excuse me. Take one sip of water. And I'll say as much as I can about him. Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. And today's founder is Stephen Decatur, the conqueror of the Barbary Pirates. Now, there is so much I could say about Stephen Decatur. Um, I, they, there should be entire movies. You could probably make five movies about his life with all his adventures, despite the fact that he dies fairly young, which we'll get to. Now, this is going to be a brief overview of his life, and I'm going to note certain things points uh, that I think are noteworthy for fans of the American Revolution. So, let's talk about it. Stephen Decatur comes from a naval family. His father had served in the Continental Army, and Stephen trains with his father in and just trains in the family business in general as a youth. And while he's still in his teens, he joins the Navy and serves in the quasi-war with France. Now, again, as just a teenager, he establishes himself as one of the most reliable crewmen in the Continental Army. Uh, he becomes an officer. He ends up sailing off in the first Barbary, Barbary War, which took place against North African pirates. Uh, under the Jefferson administration, um, the several, what they called the Barbary states of North Africa, which today we basically consider um, Algeria, Tunisia, and I believe Morocco. Uh, the, the, the states there, they, they were taking American prisoners. They'd capture ships, hold them hostage, and ask for a ransom. And under the first few administrations, they were kind of paying those ransoms. And to Thomas Jefferson's credit, he said no more. And he sent a fleet. Uh, among that was Stephen Decatur. Now, he wasn't leading ships yet, but he had already come from this very important family and had already started establishing himself as a very reliable leader of men. Then there was a ship that Decatur was not on called the Philadelphia. And the Philadelphia runs aground off the coast of Tripoli. 
Stephen is then given the task of overseeing a daring mission to either rescue the ship or destroy it. Now, the ship is run aground within view of the harbor of their opponent. And furthermore, a few people are on the ship that are not Americans. Many Americans were actually taken prisoner from the Philadelphia. So Decatur sails up. He has a few men uh, who speak Arabic on the ship, talking nice and loud, trying to look like they're not going towards the Philadelphia. Uh, and at the last minute, they sail in nice and close. They jump on and board the ship. They take it no problem because there's only a handful of people on it. And they try and get it loose. And they can't get the Philadelphia free. So as the enemy sees this happening, they start approaching. Stephen Decatur actually burns the Philadelphia, gets on the ship, and they sail away back to the rest of the fleet. He, this is, I've glossed over this endeavor to such a degree because by the time he even gets back to America, by the time he gets back to Europe, his name has now spread far and wide and he's become famous for his heroics that day. In fact, when word gets back to America, he is named Captain, uh, retroactive to the day that he burned the Philadelphia. And he is at just 25 years and one month old, the youngest person in still to this day in the history of the United States to be named Captain in the United States Navy. And that's just the beginning of his career. He's, again, 25 years old. Basically a child. <laughs> Sorry for those of you watching who are younger than 25. You're grown-ups. It's great. <laughs> but uh, he continues with heroics throughout this time. Uh, when they go back in the in the battle, of, uh, they, they continue to attack the pirates in and around Tripoli. And in fact, that's where we get the, the term on the shores of Tripoli. It uh, comes from, sorry for my terrible rendition, uh, comes from these uh, attacks. Unfortunately for Decatur, one of his brothers is actually wounded uh, during the First Barbary War. Before he dies, they one of his... His brother had jumped on a ship that looked like it was surrendering, and then they stabbed him. And this treachery is brought to Stephen almost immediately. He jumps on another gunboat, goes off. Him and I think it was eight other guys, might have been six other guys, are outnumbered like four to one or something crazy like that. They jump on this other ship, and despite being outnumbered, they, the way they take formation with swords, they are able to annihilate all the other guys in revenge for his brother's garbage attack. Uh, he then goes back. He's able to spend the last few hours of his brother's life with him uh, and then he passes away but again another heroic moment that gets back to the united states so this guy's over in the mediterranean just building this gigantic reputation during the first few years of the thomas jefferson administration they come back uh he after that war he ends up helping to build uh several ships uh quickly gets appointed as a commodore one of the youngest people to ever be a commodore in the american navy uh, and then eventually the War of 1812 breaks out. Now, I'm not going to go in too deep on the whole War of 1812. Again, he has tons of heroic acts, uh, although much of the famous battles of the War of 1812 when it comes to the Navy are on the Great Lakes. Uh, he's generally on the um, Atlantic. And during this time, he actually gets cornered in uh, New London, Connecticut, on the Thames River in Connecticut. Uh, the British chase him down, he goes and hides up there, and they blockade him into New London. And he has a fleet, a small fleet of ships with him at this point. He's blockaded in for a few months, and then he decides to try and run the blockade. And he goes out, and the British know he's coming, and chase him right back in. Now, it is questionable how the British knew he was coming. Uh, it's actually questionable if they even did know he was coming. But some people say Stephen saw him himself. It's himself. But it seems that certain members of his crew came to him and said that while they were trying to run the British blockade, there were blue lights on the shore of New London. And the accusation was that there were actually member Americans in Connecticut who were signaling the British to say, hey, Stephen's coming. Decatur's trying to run your blockade. And Decatur writes a letter to uh, the Secretary of the Navy that ends up getting published in several papers saying just that. Now, I'll remind you, this is a time where many people, especially in New England, but the Federalist Party was not doing so great politically. They were being, they held almost no positions except in state governments, primarily in New England. The Federalists did not like the War of 1812. They didn't want to be fighting in it. So 
the accusation was that there were actually Federalists in Connecticut that wanted to see the Americans lose the war so that they could possibly what well, a thousand things just do a lot of things wrong probably this was not happening but that accusation was really important because it was followed up shortly thereafter by the hartford convention which also was accused of trying to cede new england from the united states <clears throat> and although we, we very rarely hear the term blue lights and, and actually when i was writing about decatur i was going to just write the article about Blue, the blue lights, and then I realized, oh, I never wrote about Decatur at all, so I gotta cover his whole life. And it probably could have been two weeks worth of articles, because his story keeps going. We're like halfway done here. <laughs> I'm making it as quick as I can, but I do want to note that these blue lights made, uh, it made the people of Connecticut, especially, and members of the Federalist Party, look not just like the minority party, but look like treasonous traitors to many people in the United States. And Connecticut was kind of known as the hotbed of treason because of this blue light scenario now of course the war ends later that year and uh connecticut's still part of the united states but uh, you know the, the blue lights you you see many uh founders at that time communicating and and even james madison at one point i read a letter where he was essentially brushing it off like yeah i know about the blue lights but it's just not as important as what we're talking about you know we need to win this war so who cares <laughs> um now time goes by a few years after the war of 1812 ends well we got stephen decatur here who's uh, got to go fight another war. And this war is known as the Second Barbary War. It's sent back to the, uh, the, the um, Mediterranean. Again, these Barbary pirates in North Africa are capturing American ships, keeping American sailors hostage. And it's not just American uh, warships. They're actually like American just merchant vessels. So they're just capturing Americans and, and other nations. It's not just America, but America seems as kind of an easy target being such a young country with a, such a small navy well at this point St commodore decatur is in charge of uh not in charge of the whole operation but in charge of the main thrust of the operation he sails into the mediterranean uh he conquers the biggest of uh, the 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 ships this time it's more algeria than uh uh, uh tunisia but uh he conquers the biggest most powerful barbary ships and then basically sails into Algeria and says, I've got your ships, come deal with me. And the war, for, for, for it lasts longer than this, but the, the heart of the war is essentially two days. He just sails in, takes all the ships, sails to Algeria, uh, Algeria and says, here's the deal, take it. And the Bay of Algeria gives in to almost all his demands. And by the time he gets back to the United States, Stephen Decatur has been now dubbed conqueror of the Barbary pirates because his heroics in the first Barbary war and his leadership in the second Barbary war. And it is really essentially the last time we're done fighting in Africa until world war two breaks out. And that's more of a Hitler thing, but that's also not part of this channel. So, uh, go somewhere else for your world war two history. It's fun. Not what we're doing here though. Now, Stephen Decatur gets back to the United States and he's still only 41 years old which is i've been talking for quite some time now and stephen decatur is still only 41 years old he's basically my age and that's when tragedy strikes you see it back in 1807 the, the second barbary war was in 1815 1816 a decade earlier than that, there had been something called the Chesapeake Leopold Affair, which we've talked about before. And there was another Commodore in the army, James Barron, who, just to get through it really quick, had a new ship called the Chesapeake, which Stephen Decatur helped build. <laughs> and uh, he went out and the British tried to impress people on the ship. And James Barron did not do a good job. And several people were taken from his ship. Uh, and he was embarrassed by this. And Barron was given a court martial. And one of the people on the court martial was a younger man named Stephen Decatur. Uh, the court martial basically bans him. I forget how long he was banned, but like Baron was a Commodore and he was not allowed to be a part of the Navy for, I think it was five years. And then he goes and he comes, he comes back and joins the Navy again as a Commodore. He never really forgives Decatur for this uh, because they had actually been worked closely together. And for a little bit, Decatur actually looked to Baron as a, um, a role model for a lack of a better term because again he was super young <laughs> compared to all these other seasoned veterans so decatur goes uh goes back home when he gets home 
Well, James Barron says, I challenge you to a duel. And I want a side note here. There was a real problem at this point with Commodores of the United States Navy dueling each other because they kept killing each other off. And sadly, it's no different for Stephen Decatur. Barron challenges him to a duel. Decatur's a man of honor. Now, this duel is different than almost any other duel I've ever heard. And, and I suggest you guys go and read about the specifics. I'll cover them as briefly as I can here. But they stand about four feet apart from each other. Or, I'm sorry, eight feet apart from each other. So when they put their arms out, they are like point-blank range. And one of the seconds says, I'm going to count to three. Uh, you can fire after I say one but not after I say three. So you have between one and three to fire. And they're standing right there. He says one, bam out. They both shoot and they both go right down. Now they're grabbing their sides. They're screaming in pain. Uh, Decatur pretty much knows it's over. Uh, he gets gently put on a cart. And as he's getting put on a cart, uh, Decatur says, basically says, I, for, I forgive you. Oh, Decatur, I for, forgive you. You're a great man or something along those lines. And Decatur just says, farewell, Baron. Farewell. Farewell. Gets put on the thing. Yeah, gets brought to a house and spends the rest of the day in writhing pain, where apparently he said, I know not that a man could suffer such pain. Uh, and he dies later that night, again, at just 41 years old. Now, I just want to reiterate, what I just told you is the most brief version you are ever going to get of Stephen Decatur's life. Although I did spend a little bit of time on the blue lights because that's what I was reading about most this week. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I, I recommend you go look up Stephen Decatur. He's a fascinating character, you know, from the from the, the Quasi War with France all the way through the Second Barbary War. Just arguably one of, if not the most important naval hero in American history. Uh, despite the fact that his name is not very well known. So again, I really encourage you to look up a little bit more of Stephen Decatur. I also encourage you to hit like and subscribe because I know you enjoyed this video if you've watched this far. Uh, and I give you American Revolution several days a week. No World War II though, like I said before, but I will give you American Revolution. So thank you for watching. Like I said, hit like and subscribe uh, for a new founder every single day. Uh, for those of you who uh, want one more founder, we're going to talk about James Manning. I'm going to sip a little water. I am getting hot because my AC has been off for now an hour. <laughs> Let me get through one more founder here. For those of you who play trivia, uh, definitely come tomorrow. I have, I have a little something special planned. Uh, a little bit of a, an announcement. Uh, I'll give you a hint. I'm going to give out some homework in the future. Uh, but it's nothing but fun. Trust me. Um, you can trust me. I'm on the internet. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about James Manning. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I am a lot redder than I was when I started. Okay. <laughs> it's going to happen all summer long. I can't leave the little AC unit on because it's just too loud. Okay, heard some banging. Someone's going to sleep. It's not going well. <laughs> okay. Again, we only have six founders this week because I was sick last week. I do apologize for that. My thumbnail is deceiving. Uh, that is the one lie I will tell you today is that there were seven in the thumbnail. Just six this week. Uh, thank you for being here, but we're going to talk about the French coming to town. Let's do it. Hi, Founder fans, Jason here. And today's founder is James Manning, who was a president, the first president, of Brown University. So, James Manning graduated from Princeton, New Jersey, and he was I then asked to move over to Rhode Island. You see, Rhode Island had a large collection of Baptists, and he had just become a Baptist minister. And, well, those Baptists in Rhode Island had just started a college, and that college's name was the College in the English Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. It's a mouthful. It's a real mouthful. Today we know the college in the English colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations as Brown University. It's a lot simpler, and that's actually because uh, one of Manning's contemporaries, uh, the Brown family, contributed a lot of money to establishing it. Either way, he goes there, he's chosen as first president, of, uh, as, on president of Brown University, uh, and he ends up spending the better part of 30 years running Brown University. He also helps oversee construction of the first buildings at Brown University. Now, this is just after the Boston Tea Party. After the Boston Tea Party, you get the Massachusetts uh, uh, Punishment Act, which essentially closes the port of Boston. And there are all these sailors in Boston that now can't do their sailing, and they need work. And Manning provides work for many of the people who were left without because of their participation in the Boston Tea Party to help build the buildings 
of Brown University, specifically usually shipbuilders who were accustomed to building, not just seamen who were used to being sailors. Uh, the, 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 the shipbuilders are pretty good at constructing ships, so they can just build squares instead of round bottoms, one would presume. So, excuse me. Uh, he is, uh, he also said to have made a trip to Philadelphia about this time to try and convince the Continental Congress uh, of how important it is to keep religious liberty. Uh, certain denominations of uh, um, Christianity were nervous that when things played out in this war that was going on, it would end up that they'd decide there'd just be one nation, much like the Church of England had just the Church of England. Uh, many of the uh, people who were not what we would call Anglicans uh, were a little bit nervous that they would take over. Uh, and Manning helped uh, provide the impetus, one of the many, many people who provided the impetus for the freedom of religion that would come later. But before that, James Manning is, you know, running Brown University. And then in 1780, well, the French come to town, because the French are coming to help the Americans, and they come to Rhode Island. They spend some time in Rhode Island. Now, they're there for over a year before they actually journey south to take part in the victory at Yorktown. And while they're in Rhode Island, well, they need a place to stay. And James Manning offers Brown University, again, at this time called the College in Rhode Island, Providence Plantations. He offers Brown University to the French army, and they take him up on that. And in fact, um, it was the, uh, the college's main hall. James lets them turn that into a military hospital. Usually this is kind of frowned upon, but uh, no, James was a patriot, and he wanted the French to be comfortable in America, because that way they could do a good job helping the Americans. So after the war, he's actually chosen by Rhode Island to go to the Continental Congress, which at that point was called the, we refer to it as the Con Congress of the Confederation. So while he's there, he becomes associated with James Madison. The two work together, they serve together on the Grand Committee. Um, they, be they discuss at length changes needed for the Articles of Confederation, uh, and he supports this. So when James Madison later writes the United States Constitution, or helps write the United States Constitution, James Manning is very fervently in support of the Constitution. Now, he's actually invited, despite being in Rhode Island all this time, uh, he becomes such a big supporter of the national government that when the Massachusetts Ratification Convention is called into action. Ratific and Massachusetts, Rhode Island takes a long time. Washington's president for like a year and a half before Rhode Island joins the Union. But Massachusetts is necessary. It's one of the bigger colonies, one of the wealthier ones. It's really important to independence. And James Manning is uh, asked to come and say the closing prayer at the Ratification Convention just before they do the final vote. And his sermon is filled with such patriotic rhetoric and such fervor and support for the Constitution that it is said that he sways a few votes and helps pass the Constitution at the Massachusetts Ratification Convention. Now, we can never know what was in the mind of the people who were listening to Manning and then voted, but it certainly seems that he was able to help convince a few people who didn't know which way they should be convinced. And that is the story, a very brief story, of James Manning, an early president of Brown University. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you hit like and subscribe for American Revolution all week long. And sadly, that's it. I'll bring myself back up. Thank you guys for coming. Got a nice... Got this awful bottle. Again, got a toothache. It's the only way I can drink water. Great. <laughs> Uh, and, and I apologize, it's only the six founders this week, but there will be an impartial examiner, part three, released tomorrow that I will talk about next week. Questions, your comments, concerns, anything like that, I am here for you. Thank you for your support, watching the channel, hitting like, and just being all around great fans of the American Revolution. Uh, it, uh, and that's it. Bye. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, that is essentially it, though. Uh, if you have any, like I said, comments feel free to email me find me on the social medias yada yada and yada and we end this video with round bottom so i'm gonna give you a nice round bottom and you guys have a great afternoon